I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, another edition of our Thursday Grand Rounds for the Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, this is our uh, penultimate episode, our second to last episode of the uh, long academic year. It has been a wonderful year, so we'd like to thank Jennifer Newcomb for all her incredible work in coordinating these Grand Rounds. Um, uh, and uh, we will have again um, today and one more uh, next week, uh, June 2nd, will be our last of the year. Uh, so um, thank you for what has been a wonderful attendance from our USF residents, uh, USF fellows, our USF attendings. Uh, keep it up for another two weeks today and next Thursday. We have a very, very talented young physician with us, Dr. Enola Okonkwo. Uh, I think I practice it better than, than I said it here, Okonkwo. Uh, so Dr. Okonkwo is the Associate Program Director in the Division of Emergency Medicine, the Emergency Medicine Residency, uh, in our own USF Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, it warms the heart to say that she is a graduate of Indiana University School of Medicine, and the reason it warms the heart, you'll find out more next week, in our, uh, we are in our 50th anniversary of our USF Department of Internal Medicine and our founding chairman. Uh, founding chairman was Roy Benke, uh, for who we named these Grand Rounds, the Roy Benke Grand Rounds. Roy Benke came from Indiana University. So Dr. Quonquo, uh, you have incredible lineage uh, with the Department of Internal Medicine coming from Indiana University. Um, after Dr. Quonquo uh, conquered IU and uh, graduated uh, in impressive fashion. She went to Charlotte, North Carolina, to the Carolinas Medical Center, uh, where she was a superstar emergency medicine resident. We were blessed when she joined Team Health Emergency Medicine upon completion of her residency here at Tampa General, and then joining our Department of Emergency Medicine at the same time. She has immersed herself in the Program Evaluation Committee, Diversity Initi uh, the Diversity Initiative Committee, uh, many, many educational initiatives uh, with outstanding uh, work on her on the uh, emergency medicine educational blog, um, and um, and especially with a very interesting novel biopatch syncope home monitoring system, which she helped develop with USF Cardiology. Uh, she has already in her short time here been the co-PI or the PI on eight studies. Uh, so extremely impressive, and we are blessed to have her giving us today's uh, Grand Rounds. The title is Tachyarrhythmias, Recognizing, Managing, and Avoiding the Pitfalls, an outstanding and very important topic. So Dr. Okonkwo, thank you for joining us, and take it away. Hey, thank you. That was a nice welcome. Let me share my screen with you all. So hello, I'm Dr. Okonkwo. I'm one of the ER doctors here at Tampa General, like you said. I'm also the Associate Program Director for our residency program. It's an honor to be here with you today. We'll be talking about tachyarrhythmias, and I chose this topic because tachyarrhythmias and arrhythmia management in general is something that's part of the daily practice of ER physicians, but it's also an area where you all have a lot of overlap as well. So um, my goal is for all of you to leave here feeling more comfortable in your approach to arrhythmias. So for our interns in the room, if you haven't received that 3 a.m. call that your patient's gone into an arrhythmia, you will, and this talk is especially uh, for you. I have no financial conflict of interest. Our objectives today, we're gonna develop an algorithmic approach to the management of arrhythmias. I think that that is uh, the best approach and important that you use that approach. We're gonna build a framework for the differential diagnosis of cardiac arrhythmias, again, so that you can think quickly. We're gonna recognize the ECG features and common pitfalls of tachyarrhythmias that originate above the ventricles. And I say above the ventricles because for the sake of time, we don't have time to get into ventricular tachycardia today. And then we'll go through the initial acute management of these arrhythmias. So leave it to the ER doctor to start a talk with an arrhythmia algorithm. But this is an important piece because your patient may or may not be unstable and you need to be able to think quick and make good medical decisions uh, fast. So the best approach is probably by using an algorithm. And this is the algorithm we teach in emergency medicine. So step number one is to take a deep breath. Remember, you can do this. You were trained for this. 
it's important. It sounds silly, but you got to check your own heart rate before you can move on to checking someone else's. Step number two is you want to make sure a patient in a potential arrhythmia, but you, you have continuous monitoring in place. You've got good IV access. You know where the airway equipment is and the crash cart is in case you need that. And you've got the defibrillator, defibrillator at bedside if you're going to do any kind of um, intervention because sometimes the unexpected happens. So it's best to prepare for the worst. And not only will that ward off evil spirits, but if something unexpected does happen, you're prepared. So even in the patient with stable SVT, for example, if you're going to be giving adenosine, they really need to be on the defibrillator. Step number three is determining, is this patient stable or unstable? And this really begins from the moment you receive the phone call or the page, up into the, the second you walk into the room and you're evaluating the patient. And I'll tell you, for testing purposes, this is always a black and white area. But in the real world, it's more nuanced. So for example, you may be dealing uh, with a patient that's got a blood pressure of 80 systolic or 90 systolic and a heart rate of 160, but they're setting up talking to you, they're texting pictures to their grandkids, they look okay. So that patient uh, doesn't necessarily need emergent cardioversion. Another example of that is for test taking purposes, you'll be taught if they're experiencing ischemia, that's an indication to emergently cardiovert. But Often you'll ask a patient, are you experiencing any chest pain? And they'll say like, yeah, doc, I got a little something right here. That's a whole lot different than grandma clutching her chest, looking like she's circling the drain. That patient might actually need emergently cardioverted. So it's a little nuanced. And the more you do this, the more you'll uh, really begin to understand what's stable and what's unstable and when do you need a, to emergently cardiovert. Step number four is important. It's looking for P waves. And we do this because it's gonna help us narrow down what is our differential. Uh, diagnosis. Not everything with P waves is going to be sinus rhythm, but of course, if it is, we need to know. And then determine if it's wide or narrow. This is also important. We like things that are narrow because that suggests it originated above the level of the ventricle. Those patients tend to be more stable. So that, that makes me happy to see it narrow. And then is it regular or irregular? With irregular, leaning towards things like atrial fibrillation. And from there, once you've walked through that, you kind of begin to think about your differential diagnosis. And this is my simple differential diagnosis for tachyarrhythmias. And I would suggest that everybody kind of generate uh, this so that you are able to use it time and time again until it just becomes concrete memory. And you'll see that I've removed sinus tachycardia from here because I, I no longer really need to think about that. It's always on my radar. But for example, if I know I'm dealing with a narrow, irregular rhythm, I immediately know, okay, this could be AFib. That's what it most commonly is. Maybe it's atrial flutter with a variable block. Maybe it's multifocal atrial tachycardia. So that's where those P waves come in. I'm looking for that. Uh, same thing with premature beats. I'm looking for things like PACs or uh, even respiratory variation that could be sinus. So it's important to begin to fall back on uh, this differential diagnosis and make it as simple as possible so that you don't have to use uh, too much thought in these situations that can be high stress. So we're going to go through today using a case-based approach. So case number one is a 25-year-old female who's admitted for cannabis hyperemesis. And you get a call that the patient's complaining of her heart's pounding, she's short of breath. The nurse is pretty sure this patient's gone into an arrhythmia. So you walk into the room and you see and hear this. So you're looking at this monitor thinking, yep, looks like maybe she's going into an arrhythmia. Holy crap, what am I going to do? So you default back to your algorithm. You take a deep breath. You remember, you got this. For this particular patient, good news. We've got IV access. The nurse has already hooked up the patient to the defibrillator. She's on continuous monitoring. All those things are in place, and that's good because we need it potentially. You never know when a patient's going to decompensate. In terms of stability, this patient is setting up. She's able to talk to us. She's mildly diaphoretic. Her blood pressure is 140, but overall, we vote that she looks stable. So that makes us happy. We've got time to get a 12 lead EKG and think about things for a minute. Step number four, we go through looking for P waves. And when you look for P waves, you're going to begin usually uh, looking in lead two first. So you go through that entire lead and we don't see any. But a big take home message today is look in every single lead for P waves. If you don't, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to either overdiagnose an arrhythmia or miss an arrhythmia. So in this particular EKG, when we look through every single lead, we don't see any normal P waves, so our answer is no P waves. And is this wide or narrow? This is nice and narrow, and is it regular and 
or irregular, this is a regular tachycardia. And if we were to pull out our EKG calipers, we can see here that they're occurring at very regular intervals. So from there, I know that my differential for this narrow regular tachycardia is SVT. And there are two main types of SVT that this could represent, um, just simplifying it. Or it could be atrial flutter with hidden P waves. And of course, I would consider sinus if I saw P waves as well. So this happens to be SVT. So let's talk about SVT a little. Some of the common symptoms that patients are going to complain about include things like palpitations, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, anxiety, or panic attack. Um, that's actually a really common one. So if you ever get a call that your patient's in a new panic attack, I'll always consider, could it be an arrhythmia? It's uh, commonly misdiagnosed. And then patients will often complain of a little bit of chest pressure, like I said. The risk factors for SVT, women are actually two times more likely than men to have SVT, and older people are actually more likely. But you're going to see this in patients that are young and healthy with no other comorbidities. Lone SVT, meaning there's no cardiovascular disease, there's no accessory pathway, that occurs in about half of the females. But only about 10% of males have lone SVT. They're much more prone to having an accessory pathway uh, present. I'm a big believer that if you're going to be treating a condition, you should at least know a little bit about the pathophysiology driving it. So let's take a minute first uh, to talk about one of the most common types of SVT, and that's AVNRT. And to understand that, let's, let's jump back to sinus rhythm. What's going on in the normal heart? You guys remember in the normal heart, the SA node sends an impulse down to the AV node. And the AV split separate little pathways temporarily a slow pathway, and a fast pathway. And they work exactly like they sound. This impulse hits simultaneously, the impulse begins traveling down both sides, and the fast pathway hits first, goes onto the ventricles, and the two kind of cancel out here, and you don't get any circuit or abnormal connection, you get normal sinus rhythm. What can happen in SVT when you're dealing with AV nodal reentrant tachycardia though, is that the impulse hits the AV node, and at that particular moment, it finds the fast pathway in a refractory period. So it turns out that though the fast pathway is fast, it actually has a longer refractory period. So if a, a beat comes earlier, something, it could hit here and it begins traveling down the slow pathway and unfortunately it can't travel down the fast. So it reaches the ventricles and then it finds the path, the fast pathway now no longer in that refractory period and it can travel back up into that node and create this circuit that creates your arrhythmia here. Um, also, just a, a tip here, when you're talking about SVT and you see the alphabet soup of AVNRT versus AVRT, it took me forever to memorize that. And really, I don't even know that it's super important that you do. But one helpful thing for me is I think about the N that stands for nodal also as meaning normal. So these patients don't have an accessory pathway. This is simply an arrhythmia occurring within the AV node itself. What does it look like on the EKG? It's going to be fast by definition. It's usually narrow unless you have an underlying bundle branch block, um, which I'll show you some of those coming up, or you have an accessory pathway that could create a wider complex SVT. You are not going to appreciate normal P waves in SVT. That's part of what makes SVT. However, I'll show you there are some retrograde P waves that you can train your brain uh, to pick up on. It's normal to see ST depression and AVR elevation in SVT. And this is important because my ER brain, immediately when you tell me that we've got AVR elevation and diffuse depression, I start worrying about ischemia. I start thinking about proximal LAD lesions um, or triple vessel disease. And in the setting of SVT, these findings do not correlate with coronary artery disease. You don't need to be worried about that unless those findings persist despite restoring sinus rhythm. Another cool thing you'll see on patients with SVT, I'm going to point out a finding called pseudoelectrical alternance coming up. So here's our run-of-the-mill SVT. It is fast. It is narrow. If you look through the CKG, you're not going to appreciate any normal Q waves, but I want to draw your attention to lead V1. When you look there, you see this little blip. We call this the pseudo R prime, and this is actually a retrograde Q wave. If you start looking out for that, it's one of the clues that you could be dealing with SVT and you've got a retrograde Q wave there. You also can appreciate on this EKG 
there's AVR elevation, and you can see some diffuse depressions throughout. Again, totally normal findings in the setting of SVT. Here's a patient in SVT where you can see the retrograde P waves here. You may not be used to looking at inverted P waves or retrograde P waves, but uh, once you know they're there, pretty obvious. And you can see them in some other places throughout the EKG as well. Again, here's our pseudo R prime representing a retrograde P wave in SVT. And you can see when this patient goes into sinus, they lose that little blip there. So the pseudo R prime goes away. This is the cool finding of pseudo electrical alternance. You can see it should remind you of electrical alternance. So remember, electrical alternance occurs when the heart uh, is setting in a pericardial sac filled with fluid and it's swinging back and forth. And you get these alternating voltages that um, can look a lot like this, but the difference is in pseudo electrical alternance, the voltage is normal. Obviously, a lot of things weigh into voltage, body habitus, and other disease processes. But if you were to put an ultrasound probe on this patient's heart, they're not going to have a pericardial effusion. This is just a normal finding that's been reported in SVT. And if you start paying attention to all the SVT EKGs that come across, you'll see that sometimes this cool finding is there. And um, not really important, but makes me happy to find it. All right. Now, sometimes SVT can look wide. So SVT with a bundle branch block can look wide. My take home message to you is if you were dealing with a wide complex tachycardia, treat it like VTAC. There are many smart people out there that will tell you that there are algorithms to help you differentiate uh, between VTAC and SVT with a bundle branch block. But the truth is those algorithms really lack inner rate of reliability. They're not uh, very easy to do, especially when you're stressed out and dealing with a patient in a new arrhythmia. So if you treat this as VTAC until proven otherwise, um, everybody stays safe. How do we manage SVT and particularly if it's unstable SVT? Well, luckily you're not gonna see that very often. Usually SVT is stable, but if it is unstable, you can use synchronized cardioversion at hundred joules. This is one of the rare times that you could actually also use adenosine. The drug works almost as fast as an electrical shock. So I would lean towards synchronized cardioversion, but uh, reasonable even in the unstable patient to reach for adenosine. Now you guys know if the patient's stable, our first line treatment should be vagal maneuvers. I hope you haven't given up on them. Often people will say, you know, bear down. You're gonna bear down like you're having a bowel movement or you're gonna blow through the syringe. Well, one big take home message from today's lecture is I want all of you to leave here knowing about the REVERT trial. The REVERT trial was a randomized control trial that looked at 400 patients with SVT, and they were randomized to either the standard Valsalva, where basically they had them blow through a syringe, versus uh, what's called the modified Valsalva maneuver. And what they do is they have you blow through the syringe for 15 seconds, then you flip the patient upside down and lift their feet up for 15 seconds, and then you set them back up. And it works 43% of the time, restoring sinus rhythm. And when you think about that, that's pretty incredible. It's doesn't cost a thing, there are no side effects, um, and it works 100% of the time, 43% of the time. So let me show you a video, um, just what this really looks like, because this really should be your first line treatment. So they're having him blow through the syringe for 15 seconds, then they set him uh, reclined like that with feet up for 15 seconds, and magically, what will happen, and of course they're on continuous monitoring during all of this, you've got the defibrillator pads in place, they're gonna return to sinus. It's pretty magical. Uh, I've had really good success with this. So make this modified Valsalva your first line treatment of stable SVT. If that doesn't work, we gotta move on to medications. And you all know from ACLS that adenosine is going to be our first line medication here. The dosing for that is six milligrams followed by 12 milligrams. You probably know that too, but what you might not know if you've never given this is that it's really uncomfortable for the patient. In fact, in the ER, I'll have patients that they've had SVT before and they come in and they say, please, dear God, don't give me that medication. I almost died last time. And they feel like they're truly dying. So make sure if you're going to give adenosine, you warn your patient about that side effect. And keep in mind too, that this medication has a very short half-life. It starts metabolizing the second it hits the red blood cell surface. 
So uh, it's important that you give this using either a three-way stopcock where you can push the drug and then flush it very quickly, or you could have the drug pulled up in a 20 cc syringe with normal saline already in there and then push it as one big push to get to the heart quickly. A couple other considerations if you're going down the adenosine route for treating SVT. Remember in heart transplants, they're actually more sensitive to adenosine. When I was in uh, residency, I had this mantra that atropine doesn't work for heart transplants and adenosine works too well. And I would just constantly kind of make that concrete in my mind. And um, that is true. So you're going to cut your dose down. Certain medications actually potentiate the effects of adenosine as well. So a patient that's on Agronox or carbamazepine, you're actually gonna, going to give a smaller dose there. And if you're pushing it directly into a central line, so let's say you're pushing right into the right IJ, you're going to cut your dose as well there. Now, what would you think if I told you there was actually an option that was pain-free? It didn't cause that side effect of feeling like you're going to die. Well, it turns out there was a Cochrane review that showed calcium channel blockers are at least as effective at terminating SVT as adenosine. And in fact, these patients had less risk of going back into SVT. And that makes sense because the, the half-life is um, obviously a lot longer for calcium channel blockers than adenosine. So the effects are going to hang around longer. It's going to prevent going back into SVT. Now, what these studies didn't look at, they didn't address the patient satisfaction or the patient comfort. And I wish they had, because we all know calcium channel blockers would have uh, definitely shined there. So for me, calcium channel blockers, and particularly diltiazem, has basically replaced adenosine as my first line treatment for um, SVT. With that being said, I want to warn you that calcium channel blockers are not for everyone. We work in a culture where it's very diltiazem heavy, but there are contraindications. So keep in mind, diltiazem can cause hypotension. Diltiazem is bad if you've got a patient with severe systolic heart failure. Um, don't give it to those people, or you're going to call. You're going to cause what I call the dilt spiral of death. So um, this would also be another one where I wouldn't be giving this to someone with a wide complex party where I'm in between, is this SBT and aberrancy or is this VTAC? Not appropriate there. If you're going to reach for this, there are a couple different ways that you can give it, but um, the way I do it and the way uh, it is supported in the literature, you could give it as a bolus, just like you would for AFib at 0.25 mix per kick. And you don't really need a drip after that. You give that bolus, it kicks in in a couple of minutes, patient goes into sinus, there's no pain or drama um, usually associated with this tolerated well as long as they're not hypotensive to begin with and they have no contraindications. Um, an alternative would be starting a drip and kind of titrating it in slowly, but uh, though that's a described me method, uh, I don't use that and I don't find that to be as useful. You could also give verapamil. To be honest, I've never given verapamil at TGH, so uh, the kaizen seems to be our drug of choice. Another cool fact about giving a calcium channel blocker as your first line therapy is if you messed up and you actually miss diagnosed uh, flutter, you, you thought it was SPT, but it was actually flutter, well, now you've got rate control, as opposed to if you gave adenosine, the patient's going to get the drug, they're going to get that feeling that they're going to die, and you see the lovely flutter waves, which can be diagnostic, but it doesn't actually do anything for the treatment. They go right back into that treatment, or right back into that tachycardia, and then you're going to have to move forward with a different treatment. So here's an example of a patient with SVT and an underlying bundle branch block. And again, my take home message to you is if it's wide, just treat it like VTAC and proven otherwise. So how would you treat a sustained ventricular tachycardia? Totally reasonable to do a synchronized cardio version on this patient. Now, if you're going to jump to medications for them, uh, procainamide would be an option, as would amiodarone. You could get away in this wide complex regular tachycardia with trying adenosine. But I want you to realize that even if it terminates, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was absolutely SVT. Sometimes, sometimes VTAC will do funny things and it will terminate with adenosine as well. So um, just best to assume VTAC. Let's talk about the second most common type of SVT and that's ABRT. So atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. These patients have an accessory pathway. So the patient that I typically think of with the accessory pathway is my wolf parkinsons spike pathway. And how this SVT looks on the EKG really depends on which direction is the impulse traveling. So an orthodromic 
fashion, what happens is the impulse goes down the normal pathway, it hits the AP node, it goes down the bundle of his, and then picks up by the accessory pathway, and here's your arrhythmia circuit here. That's going to look like a narrow complex SVT. It's going to look all the world like you're running the mill SVT, and you're going to treat it uh, as such. Now, if it's traveling in the antidromic uh, fashion, so it's going this way, down the accessory pathway, and then back around, that's actually going to result in a wide complex tachycardia because it's less efficient as it spreads across the myocytes, slower, you're going to get uh, that wide QRS. So it's going to look like VTAC. Just taking a look at those two. So here's orthodromic. Again, it's going down the AV node first and then getting picked up the accessory pathway. It looks like running the mill SVT to me, and that's okay. We're going to treat it just like we would any other SVT, and your patient's going to do great. Now, when I'm talking to residents, they'll often say, well, if it were WPW or an accessory pathway, wouldn't we see the delta waves? And the answer is no. You usually don't see delta waves or signs of pre-excitation on uh, the EKG when they're in the arrhythmia. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that you get an EKG when you restore sinus rhythm. So not only are we looking for accessory pathways like this, we have signs of pre-excitation where we have that short PR. Some of the impulses are traveling down um, the accessory pathways. So you're getting this pre-excitation here in the widening of the QRS. Um, but again, this is a finding that you're going to see only when they're in sinus for the most part. We'd also be interested in once a patient's been in an arrhythmia and we put them back into sinus, are they experiencing ischemia? Did those scary looking uh, AVR elevations and SD depressions resolve? So we, we want to know that. Here's an example of AVRT. So again, it's traveling in the opposite direction. It's less efficient and you get this bi complex uh, QRS. How are we going to treat this? We're just going to assume that this is VTAC and everybody's safe. So what would we do specifically? I would probably just do a synchronized cardioversion for this patient, but you could go ahead and go to medications of and amiodarone. Um, if you're gonna opt for amiodarone, important that you make sure that you're dealing with a regular white complex tachycardia. And I'll point out why in a minute, because patients with WPW and AFib, uh, amio would be a, a poor option. So a couple of pitfalls that you're gonna run into in SVT, um, this is a real life example. It's not the most uh, tricky one in my opinion, but sometimes sinus rhythm can be mistaken for SVT. And this looks obvious probably to all of us. We see the P's, we see the QRSs, this is sinus tachycardia. But for this EMS crew, uh, the EKG software read it as SVT and they assumed that it was. It was fast and regular and they gave uh, adenosine. Now, it's easy to be judgmental in this particular EKG, but I've done this mistake myself where once it starts going really fast, it's hard sometimes to see that P wave activity. So uh, just keep that in mind. That is one of the pitfalls. Sinus tachycardia is sometimes mistaken as SVP and uh, not cool when we give an antiarrhythmic to sinus rhythm. Here's another one that was mistaken for SVT. So the moral of this story is the faster something's going on that EKG, the more regular it looks, right? The less variation you have, the faster it's going. So if you were to actually look at this though and march out some of these complexes, you see that sometimes you get a pretty large interval and then sometimes it comes quickly. So this is actually AFib uh, RVR and the clinicians uh, could easily mistake this for SVT, especially if you're looking at these septal leads here. All right. Second case, it's 11.02 p.m. When you get a call that your patient is having increased shortness of breath and tachycardia and went into AFib. Patient's a 63-year-old female with a past medical history, significant for hypertension, COPD, and tobacco abuse on day one of admission for a pneumonia. So you're gonna go check on this patient, right? You go into the room and you think, I got this, got an algorithm, I know about this. Uh, this particular patient, we've got good IV access, they're on continuous monitors. They appear to be stable when we walk into the room. So in the back of our minds, we are preparing for the worst. You know, we know where the code card is on this floor. We know where the defibrillator would be located. But at this moment, we don't think we need it. The patient looks really stable, um, but it's, you know, located close. So the patient turns out they, they spiked a fever about an hour ago. Um, they're normal tensive. They're able to talk to us. They're speaking in full sentences, um, just a little bit to Kepnik. 
So we're going to vote that this patient is stable. So we get our 12 lead EKG, which always gives us more information when we have a 12 lead. And we begin looking for P waves. And once we do in every single lead, we don't appreciate any clear, organized P wave activity. So we're going to say no. And is the spider narrow? It is narrow. And is it regular, irregular? It's clearly um, got a little bit of irregularity here. So we know that our narrow, irregular rhythms could be AFib, could be flutter with a variable block. Maybe it's MAT, but we don't see P waves, so we're going to vote against that. Um, and again, for PACs, we don't really see any atrial activity, so we're not, we're not thinking that. So this is AFib. Let's talk about AFib, and the first important message is that AFib RVR is a really annoying distractor. It turns out that the majority of patients uh, with this arrhythmia have a history of AFib, and this is simply their version of sinus tachycardia with all those same driving factors. So whether it's their sepsis or their fever, um, or their hyperthyroidism, think about it as an annoying distractor, especially for the patients you guys are going to take care of. Because unless you're on the CCU and you're taking care of someone who presented with new lone AFib, uh, they were probably admitted for something else. So maybe it's their urosepsis, or maybe it's something we missed and they're hiding a PE. Always make that knee jerk reaction to just pause and think what is the underlying etiology here before you jump to treating it. Second take home message I want to stress about AFib is that in a person with normal cardiac function, AFib RVR is not the cause of the patient's shock. Keep looking for another source. So if you get called new AFib, you go in, patient's hypotensive, they're not mentating, they look horrible. If that patient doesn't have one of these underlying conditions that we're going to mention, look for something else. Maybe it's because they're in septic shock. Okay, it goes back to point number one. If you or I were to go into AFib, we're going to tolerate that arrhythmia pretty well. We're not going to look like we're in shock. So the special populations that you have to consider where the arrhythmia itself could push them over the edge into a decompensated state include patients with severe cardiomyopathies. So for example, if you're dealing with a patient who has an EF of 10% and now we take away their atrial kick, which makes up about 20% of our cardiac output, sure, that patient could get hypotensive. They could start to look bad. Holcomb is another example where they're dependent on some diastolic filling time. So I've seen this where a patient comes in, we try to treat them medically, um, we're unable to control the rate well, and an hour later, they're looking bad, they're starting to decompensate. So Holcomb can do that. Valvular disease, same situation, they might be preload dependent, they might be um, very sensitive to this arrhythmia. Patients that have had recent MIs or have severe coronary disease, also keep in mind that if your heart is beating at really rapid rates, the coronaries, fill during diastole. So not only are they getting less oxygen delivered, but the rapid heart rate is requiring a higher oxygen demand. So we're going to get some mismatch, we're going to get ischemia, and depending on how severe that ischemia is, they could start to decompensate. Patients with pulmonary hypertension tend to not tolerate arrhythmias very well, so have a lower threshold for uh, cardioverting those patients. And then Patients with WPW don't do very well very long in AFib. So again, lower threshold even in the stable patient to cardiovert them. Why do we care so much about AFib? Well, we know that it's a risk factor for stroke, congest uh, congestive heart failure, and associated with MIs. And even in the acute setting, it has some prognostic value to it. So the patients that are coming in with urosepsis and AFib RBR are a bit sicker than their counterpart counterparts who aren't experiencing AFib. So just a reminder of the pathophys of AFib. Remember, it's chaotic firing from all over the atria. They hit the AV node, and luckily, our AV node is smart. The heart is smart, and it will slow down the rate here. So rather than these impulses going at 300 beats per minute, the AV node is going to permit them to go through at about a rate of 160, and that's why you see that rate commonly. What are our indications to shock? True hemodynamic stability. So you go in, they're not mentating, they're passing out, they're modeled, you know, they're developing uh, pulmonary edema in front of your eyes. Those are real indications to um, emergently cardiovert them. If they have an active STEMI, um, that's a reason you would cardiovert them. And when you do this, what you want to keep in mind is that we want to do a synchronized cardioversion. So this is our TGH defibrillator here. Here's the sync button. Very important because we want to avoid that RNT phenomenon. We don't want to take an arrhythmia that wasn't deadly and all of a sudden push them into um, ventricular fibrillation. So when you cardiovert someone, 
best to give them a little bit of pain medicine or a little bit of sedation. Use whatever you're comfortable with. People ask me that sometimes, what do you use? Um, I personally would say a little splash of fentanyl and Versed will, will do a lot of good, but use what you're comfortable with. My mentor used to say, uh, shock and apologize later. At least you saved their life. But be nice, give a little something. All right, now, if they are stable, how are we gonna treat stable AFib? So like that patient with the pneumonia, right? So number one, remember it's a distractor. So treat the underlying etiology, at least question what is that etiology and what should I be doing or what could I be missing? Then you can move on to actually controlling the rate and uh, rate control versus rhythm control, depending on where you're practicing. So here in the US, we are gonna fall towards this rate control um, preference here. But outside the US and places like Canada, they highly favor rhythm control. We base our guidelines on the American uh, College of Cardiology. And a lot of the reason we do rate control over rhythm control is based on the AFFIRM trial, which basically there are no large trials that show any benefit to a rhythm control method over a rate control method. And in fact, uh, those patients on rhythm control actually tended to have um, more adverse events. So as long as they're anticoagulated and you have rate control, the patients did pretty well. The major rate controlling agents we're going to use. Um, in the acute setting would include things like diltiazem or metoprolol, but depending on the situation, you may need to reach for other agents. So amiodarone is another common one that, you know, if, the, if your patient has severe uh, congestive heart failure, amiodarone is a safer option, or maybe it is your WPW patient, propanamide would be a good option. Propanamide is actually first line in Canada where they like that uh, rhythm control strategy. Digoxin something I reach for every now and then in the acute setting if my other agents have uh, fail, then I'm just looking for, you know, what's not going to cause hypotension, what might give me a little synergy here. You could use that in the acute setting. Um, Esmolol we rarely use, but you could. And magnesium, there's some weak evidence to suggest that magnesium could play a role, especially as an adjunctive therapy. Um, so something to consider. Our goal rate for these patients, we're going to shoot for a rate of about 110. Based on the RACE trials, we know that we don't need to overshoot that. In fact, we're going to cause more harm than good if we try to go for that normal heart rate of 80. Remember, there's probably a driving factor. There's probably some comp uh, compensation occurring there. They, they don't need a normal heart rate. Most of these patients are gonna require anticoagulation and determining anticoagulation comes down to what is their chats fast score? You know, what are their risk of stroke and what's the risk of major bleed? We're always weighing the two against each other. So there is um, a calculation you could, to help you figure out what is the risk of major bleeding. It's called the, called the has bled, so you can kind of weigh the two against each other. But to be honest, I don't find it helpful at all. It's almost the same criteria as the CHADS fast. Uh, it includes a couple other things like liver disease and alcoholism, but a lot of it's common sense. So for example, if you are dealing with a patient, you get called a new AFib, but this is day one of admission for a subarachnoid hemorrhage, bad idea to start them on anticoagulation. Or maybe they're an AFib because their hemoglobin score after a major surgery probably not the right time to start them on anticoagulation. Um, the most common uh, situation I actually see in the ER is my alcoholics who come in day after day, either in withdrawal or intoxicated, or they fell today. Um, and then they go into AFib for one reason or another. I don't start those patients on anticoagulation because in my opinion, the risk of bleed far outweighs the risk of stroke. So a couple special considerations to keep in mind when you're deciding, okay, do I want to reach for beta blocker or am I getting choose a calcium channel blocker. If the patient has hyperthyroidism as the driving source, remember the beta blockers actually help prevent some of that T4 to T3 conversion. So that could be helpful. Hokum and severe diastolic dysfunction, we tend to favor beta blockers for those patients. Same thing for ACS. As long as they don't have uh, acute congestive heart failure or active bronchospasms, beta blockers would be preferred. Um, in acute CHF, remember you want to avoid a calcium channel blocker. You don't want to take away additional inotropy in those patients. And really you want to use caution even with beta blockers in those patients if they're having acute CHF. So that's when I would reach for um, the amio or DIG in that patient who's coming in with a severely depressed um, EF. In sepsis, there's some weak evidence to suggest there might be a mortality benefit of beta blockers. I don't think we're at a point where we can definitively recommend that, but it makes sense, right? We saw some of that with um, COVID actually. So uh, consider a beta blocker if you're in between the two for that. You wanna make sure that you realize beta blockers are safe in the setting of COPD as long as they don't have concurrent asthma. 
And then for our purposes, we're going to try to avoid mixing calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. So just stick with one. Um, we'll leave that to the cardiologist to combine. There is that theoretical risk that we're going to cause too much AV nodal blockade. Uh, so we avoid mixing. Okay, when it comes to AFib, the biggest pitfall that I want to mention uh, is don't trust the EKG software. So this is an EKG I sent off on last week in triage. And for most physicians looking at this, this is pretty obviously sinus rhythm, right? You see there are P waves here. But um, not everyone's going to pick that up. And there's actually a lot of literature out there to suggest that a lot of clinicians are defaulting what the EKG software reads. I'm telling you, you're way smarter than that. Don't do that. Not only is that going to result in a lot of inappropriate workup for this patient, but you definitely don't want to be anticoagulating someone who doesn't need anticoagulation. Another pitfall is MAT. This particular example is pretty obvious. I picked it just so you could see that MAT, by definition, has three or more different QA morphologies, but sometimes it's a little trickier in real life on the EKG. So um, you've got to look, remember, in every single lead. They won't always show up right here in lead two, so look everywhere. Um, but the EKG software, again, often will misinterpret MAT because it comes irregularly. And for, for the most part, MAT doesn't require any kind of rate control. Uh, it would be rare that you would really need to rate control these patients. Instead, you're focusing on whatever the underlying etiology is. It's usually respiratory in nature, and these patients don't uh, require anticoagulation. All right. Case number three, at 6 a.m. when the nurse calls concerned that a patient's having palpitations and lightheadedness with associated diaphoresis. This is a 37-year-old male, history of AFib. They're admitted for ablation, but they're awaiting that. And the patient's described as being clammy and anxious appearing, and they can't get a manual blood pressure. So this sounds kind of bad. Um, they did get an EKG, and holy crap. So what do we do? We pause and we default to our algorithm. We take a deep breath and we remember we got this. So this patient sounds sick. They are sick. They are the one that you're going to go all out on. You're going to make sure you're delegating someone to get the IV access if we don't have it. Hopefully you've got at least one great working IV to bring in and then catch the crash or making defibrillator pads in place. And we ask ourselves, is this patient stable or unstable? Well, we can't get a blood pressure. They already passed out. Like, this is the definition of instability, right? No one's gonna judge you for emergently cardioverting this patient. They look bad. When you look through for P waves, you go in every single lead, like I asked, and we don't see any clear P waves. When you ask wide or narrow, this is wide and it is scary. So we don't like this. And is it regular or irregular? Well, if you were to get up your get out your calibers, this is pretty irregular actually. And if you look at the QRS complexes, you can see like some are a little fatter and skinnier. Uh, than the others. So this is irregular. So what is our differential there? Well, we need to be worried about, could this be polymorphic feedback? Then we would consider torsades and non-torsades versions. Maybe this is WPW with AFib, or maybe it's just AFib with a bundle branch block, but this looks really bizarre. So this is actually our WPW with AFib. And WPW with AFib is going to look like VTAC. It's going to be wide. Um, I remember it as FBI, fast, broad, and irregular. And I'm not much of a cusser on shift or at home. But um, if you have a moment during your day, like when I look at this EKG, my first thought is like, sweet mother of pearl, like holy mackerel, what is going on here with this patient? If you have a reaction like that, just make it a need to reaction to consider, could this be WPW? This is a dreaded arrhythmia because a wrong move on our part, if we give the wrong medication, that could actually result in what we call in emergency medicine, a clean kill. And none of us want to kill our patient. So the treatment for this particular patient in the vignette would be electrical cardioversion because they're unstable. If they were stable, we could actually treat WPW with AFib with procainamide. So why is this dangerous? Well, remember AFib, we've got rapid firing from the atria. Some of those impulses are going to go down the AV node, and some are going to go down the accessory pathway. And that's why you get the varying QRS complexes, because they're traveling at different efficiencies. So the less efficient uh, accessory pathway is going to create a broader QRS complex. And if we choose an AV nodal blocking agent, let's say we choose diltiazem because it's our favorite drug. Um, we all love it, right? We give this patient diltiazem. 
it blocks the AV node. And now what happens is these impulses begin to favor this accessory pathway. And that's bad because the accessory pathway is not smart. It's not like the AV node where it slows down these impulses. You begin having a transmission of these impulses at rates of 300 plus. So your patient goes into ventricular fibrillation and they die. No good. So here it is again, just to make it concrete in your mind. This looks bizarre, right? It is that sweet mother of pearl moment. It is fast, it is broad, and it is irregular. You are not going to give these patients AV nodal blockers. So no beta blockers, no calcium channel blockers. You should not really give amio to these patients. And you should not give adenosine. So <clears throat> what are we going to do? Best to assume that it's uh, a ventricular tachycardia and defibrillate. That's actually the safest thing for the patient. If they're stable, you could give propanamide. Uh, we don't do a lot of propanamide. So just keep in mind, um, propanamide, you wouldn't want to give to someone that had congestive heart failure or prolonged QTC. Those are the big um, contraindications. Last case, it's 2 a.m. You get a page because a patient has heart rates consistently of around 150. They are diabetic. They had a brief syncopal episode. And the patient is a 50-year-old male with a past medical history of a cardiomyopathy with an EF of 15% history of polysubstance abuse, who was admitted for endocarditis related to IV drug use. So just hearing that story, this patient is complex. They're pretty sick. Their heart's horrible. It's 15% EF. They probably have valvular disease. So you go into the room and you see this already on the monitor. So the nurse is already worried. They're already on the monitor. Just tacking away right there at 150. And you take your deep breath. You remember, you've got this. This is another patient where they're sick. This is complex. You better have that defibrillator on the patient. And luckily they do here. Um, but oftentimes they're not going to have that in place. You're going to have to ask, go ahead and put the defibrillator in place while you're sorting this out. Um, get your crash card there. Is the patient stable or unstable? This is an unstable patient again. So we know that solution is ultimately going to be electricity. Um, we're going to We've got a few seconds here. It doesn't take long, but we can think a little bit going down this algorithm. Are there P waves? When you first look at this EKG, um, when you're looking at lead two, your initial gut reaction may be, oh, I don't see P waves. But when you go through looking at every other lead, you can see these septal leads are often where you're going to see uh, P waves uh, the most obviously. So here they are, and you can see them. And I actually printed this guy's EKG so I could map out these P waves. So that's what those blue lines are. I'm kind of mapping out some P waves. And when you look back at lead two, they do actually have P waves here, but they're those inverted ones, okay? So they're upside down inverted P waves, but they're coming before every QRS, okay? Then I ask myself, is this wide or narrow? It is narrow. So at least we got that going for us. Is it regular or irregular? It's regular. So my differential there, you know, I consider SVT, but I just said I found P waves. So it's not SVT. And then my differential becomes, is this atrial flutter? And of course, in the back of my mind, I also would consider, is this sinus uh, tachycardia? But the reason I've mapped out these P waves, I had to do that to convince myself, nope, this isn't sinus. These are hidden P waves. This is atrial flutter. Another big clue in this EKG that I'm not dealing with sinus, this is an arrhythmia, is that I have those inverted P waves here in lead two. So inverted P waves in lead two, don't occur in sinus rhythm. You know that you're dealing either with an ectopic rhythm or atrial flutter at that point, because you shouldn't have inverted P waves there. So that patient's gonna get cardioverted, right? Uh, why does atrial flutter occur? It's basically a macro circuit that goes around the entire um, atria there. The way it's gonna look on EKG sometimes varies a little bit. So the textbook atrial flutter is gonna be a two to one conduction. But sometimes you're going to see flutter waves and it's a little bit more variable. So I've just circled some of the P waves. And you can see this is a great example where if I'm looking at lead two, I might not initially appreciate P waves. If I go through looking at every lead, um, I definitely, and look at V1 there, that money lead, you can definitely appreciate some beautiful P waves there. And lead two, I actually circled, there's the clue, um, negative inverted P waves. And um, I wish that was present in every atrial flutter case, but it's not. So if it's there, it's helpful, but it's not always there. Here's one that we get a little bit more of that textbook appearance of that um, sawtooth uh, flutter. And again, this is a variable block as well, where it's a little bit irregular. So not for fake two to one. Here's an EKG that's a pitfall. So this particular patient, um, 
was given adenosine, and it's easy to see why. When you look at this EKG, it kind of looks like it's going to be SVT. Um, I don't blame them at all for wanting to give adenosine to this patient. When they did, they get this. So you get these beautiful looking flutter waves, which obviously didn't fix the tachycardia, but it, it diagnosed flutter here. Um, my take home point to you on this is you've got to be really paranoid about flutter. It's actually the most commonly missed arrhythmia. So uh, anything with a rate of 150 plus or minus 20, look it over very closely. Be paranoid that it could be flutter. It matters, right? Because those patients are at risk for stroke. They need anticoagulation. They need a workup. Here's a EKG I had last week in triage where kind of a scary EKG, but the guy's, you know, tacking away right around 150, 160 or so, um, looks stable to me in the triage shift. Um, I look, go through my algorithm, of course, and I look for P waves. Well, lead two wasn't very helpful when I first looked at that, but I go through and again, I go to my money lead here and I begin to see clear atrial activity that's seems to be very connected to these QRSs. So that was a nice relief. And uh, based on this picture here, I think I'm dealing with atrial flutter. Of course, at TGH, we have no beds to send this patient to. So I have to send them back to the trauma bay where uh, the clinicians there decide to give this patient adenosine and it beautifully shows the uh, atrial activity in the flutter wave. So this patient was in uh, atrial flutter as suspected. So the management of atrial flutter, if it's unstable, remember you do the synchronized cardioversion. So don't forget to push that sync button. And you can actually start at lower doses for flutter as, as compared to the other arrhythmias. If it's stable, you're going to treat these patients just like you would for AFib. So you focus first on what's the underlying cause. And then if it shifts to AV nodal blocking agents, the longer acting AV nodal blocking agents and anticoagulation as indicated. Here's another pitfall. So a real TGH EKG. I got this patient at sign out and uh, the sign out was patient septic. Heart rate won't budge. It's been like 150 all day. She's in sinus tack though. Don't worry about it. And looking at this EKG, I'm proud that, you know, the providers definitely went through and they looked at every lead and they found some P waves here in V1. Um, definite P wave activity. But big clue, if you look in lead two, what do we see? We see those in, you know, inverted P waves. And actually I marched that again. Here we go, it's flutter hiding. So inverted P waves is not sinus. This is uh, another case of flutter. A another big clue in this case is the fact that it didn't budge. So flutter likes to stay you know, right at that 150. Whereas sinus tachycardia, those patients kind of jump around a little bit depending on your fluids and how much pain they're in, what's going on. So um, flutter doesn't like to budge much. If you're ever looking at an EKG and you're like, man, maybe this is flutter. Dr. Oconquo said I need to be paranoid. There is something cool you can do to kind of magnify the atrial activity. There's a uh, technique you can do called the Lewis leads or S5 leads. And it's basically some repositioning of leads to help magnify the atrial activity. I don't do this very often. I do it like a couple times a year. Um, but by repositioning some of these leads, you can uh, use that. And sometimes it will show you those lovely little flutter waves. I have a screenshot on my uh, cell phone where if I'm going to do it, I just pull up how I move the EKG around. So that was a lot of information. So let's just summarize kind of what we talked about today. So number one, I want you to develop this algorithmic approach because you've got to be able to make good decisions quickly. If you do it the same way every time, even if you only deal with this a couple times a year, you're, you're going to do a better job. Start to make a differential diagnosis. Keep it simple. Make it so that it requires little thought and it covers all the major bases, just like I've done. After you do that several times, again, it's going to be concrete, even if you're pulling it up on your cell phone to take a quick look. Remember that in a patient with stable SVT, you guys need to know about the revert trial and you need to start doing the modified Valsalva as opposed to traditional Valsalva. In AFib and Flutter, the treatment's going to be the same. You're going to first focus on whatever the precipitating factor is. Don't forget about the the distracting uh, arrhythmia theory, okay? So focus on that, then you're gonna shift your AV nodal blockade and don't forget anticoagulation as soon as possible in the patients that it's indicated in. Remember that WPW EKG, that fast, broad, irregular rhythm, and the idea that if I, if I give them the wrong medicine, this could cause a clean kill. So be paranoid about that one, look out for it. And 
if you assume that wide complex tachycardia is our VTAC, even in that setting in WPW with AFib, that's a wide complex tachycardia. If we assume that that is VTAC, uh, things will go much more smoothly. We will hurt less patients. Um, and then lastly, just remember, you are way smarter than the uh, computer interpretation. So trust yourself. Um, I wanted to share my email with you guys. If you do have any questions, please feel free to email me anytime with anything I can help on. In terms of my references, there are a lot. I'm happy to share these slides with you. And that's it. All right, thank you very much. Outstanding talk, a uh, lot of energy throughout. Almost, almost I could feel like the jewels <laughs> just surging through all your discussion. So uh, outstanding. Um, so uh, an outstanding debut at Ground Rounds. We'll, we'll have you back. <laughs> Anytime you want to come back, we will have you back. Sure, we can uh, do ventricular tachycardia sometime. Awesome. Uh, I, I again, I love your approach, and I love I love again going back to step one: check yourself, uh, take a pause, breathe. I think that was uh, excellent point that we all have to say to each other: is is take a breath, and we'll, everything's going to be fine. You're smarter than the computer. I love mm -hmm. all those points and. I remember several attendings who would say, whenever you grab an EKG off a machine uh, on the sheet, you have to fold it so that you don't even ever get to see what's on top there because yeah. it could already bias you even for that. So I still do that to this day and I read hundreds a day. So I still do that. And then after I've come up with my own interpretation, then I look and kind of, you know, sometimes it'll second guess you or pull you into something. But for the most part, it's not helpful. Absolutely. And there's no doubt we'll there's no doubt we'll look no matter what. So it's one of those things that you can't help. Uh, so we'll take any question. What questions do you guys have uh, for our outstanding Dr. Okonkwo? I think you ex extinguished any arrhythmia of doubt. Uh, <laughs> It looks like everyone is extremely satisfied, and I don't blame him. I think it was an outstanding talk. One Great. last well, call. If you think Anything? of questions, you can always email. That's right. She's got her email right there for you. So appreciate uh, another strong attendance. You know, we were up close to 60, um, which is a very nice, strong attendance. And now folks are running off uh, to get off to their clinical duties. So you'll see the number dropping. So. Don't look at that attendees. That that number was very close in, to 60 uh, throughout the talk. So um, very, I appreciate everyone uh, who attended. And we have one more grand rounds next week. There's all the clapping going on. I love it. So one more grand rounds next week. And uh, thanks everyone. Have a great Thursday. Take care. Bye.